Good evening. Thanks, everybody, for coming. This is the last program in the Adult Summer Reading Program here at Iowa City Public Library. Our theme this summer has been Build a Better World. And when we looked around Iowa City to find people or organizations that were doing things that qualified as building a better world, one of the things we looked at first was the University of Iowa's National Advanced Driving Simulator which everybody calls NADS, so I had to make sure I got the words in the right order. And they do a lot of different research about automobiles and driver safety. Um, our guest tonight is Dr. Dan McGeehy, and he wrote me a little bio, so I'm going to read it. He's most known for being noted children's book author and illustrator Claudia McGeehy's husband. <laughs> Outside of that role, his day job is as the director of the National Advanced Driving Simulator and a professor in the University of Iowa Colleges of Engineering, Medicine, and Public Health. He's been doing advanced vehicle technology research and development for 25 years, in other words, since he was about 10. So, Dan, welcome to the building. Thank you very much, Beth. So this is always a lot of fun. One of our core values at the National Advanced Driving Simulator and its associated laboratories is public outreach. And so we get really excited when we get to come and talk to the community and show off our cool cars and show off our research. We have Dr. John Gasper was here a couple of weeks ago, download his video on driver distraction. You'll learn a lot about that. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about sort of where we've been and where we're going when it comes to automated vehicles. And I'm gonna walk around this room and she's gonna be chasing me from camera to camera, so I'm just seeing everything moving around here. So I'll try not to uh, wander around too much. But we're gonna talk about uh, where we've been and where we're going. And I'll show you a couple of short videos about some really exciting uh, long-term future, but we're gonna talk about uh, some of the short-term realities uh, about uh, these technologies. But as Beth said, uh, I have the great fortune and honor to uh, lead a super dedicated group of scientists, engineers, and all sorts of really superb students uh, at the National Advanced Driving Center. This is uh, a world-renowned laboratory in our backyard. This is an $80 million driving simulator that's been uh, operational for about 15 years. The university has been doing this kind of research for even longer. We're just coming up on our 25th anniversary in doing uh, really high-tech automotive research and simulation. But part of that is also that we are on the road because that's an important part to understand not only how we can put people into really dangerous situations on the simulator that we could never do in the real world, but we also want to understand how people drive naturally. So a bit of history about how automated vehicles have come about uh, over time. It's really about connecting the dots uh, with a bunch of different technologies that started uh, quite, a while, quite a while ago, and that is in the 1958 Chrysler Imperial. I see a couple of people out there that may remember you know, driven in a car that uh, uh, was back there in the late 50s, but this was the first electronic cruise control. So in the early days of driving, you essentially locked down the throttle and it was just uh, pretty dumb. It was just sort of, it was like having the accelerator pedal stuck in one position and it would just drive. Electronic cruise control was the first to actually kind of let you coast for a while. It would accelerate up hills to maintain that speed. And most of you have this technology out there today. Now, what was really great about the Chrysler Imperial, this was really the Tesla of the 1950s, late 1950s, all the way into the late 1960s. The Chrysler Imperial was the high-tech uh, car to have out there. In fact, uh, it had the hi-fi, even had a record player, a uh, turntable uh, in our daughter who used to call it the glove department. Um, and uh, so this was really a super high-tech car uh, out there. And in fact, it remained that way until the until late 60s and was really the first car that was marketed to women. Uh, Autopilot was marketed as footless driving, because once you got on the road, you essentially turn on your cruise control uh, and the ladies wouldn't scuff up their, their pumps. Uh, I have some, I should have inserted some of the pictures about how Chrysler marketed uh, this vehicle. After the early adopters, those first people that buy technology uh, would buy that car. 
So that was the first generation of cruise control. You've most likely experienced that uh, yourselves uh, over, the year, over the years. But it wasn't until around 1998, uh, decades later, that the next generation of cruise control came along, and that's something called adaptive cruise control. Uh, and this is a technology that essentially locks onto the car ahead, uh, and you sort of get pulled along by it. And then if it begins to brake, you will begin to brake. If it accelerates, it will accelerate up to your set speed. So this technology came out in some really high-end cars, like at that time Saab and BMW, Audi, uh, Mercedes uh, had a system called Distronic, uh, but really expensive cars that were like over $100,000. Uh, the next generation of this technology then just came out uh, about five years ago uh, in those high-end cars, and that's something called stop-and-go uh, adaptive cruise control, and that's where the car will actually brake all the way to a stop as it's following a, a car in traffic. So those of you who have driven in Chicago or these really big uh, urban areas where you're in that really frustrating stop-and-go traffic, this system actually puts on the brakes, it accelerates, you put on the music, uh, it's really nice. Sort of takes over for you. That's called stop and go ACC. So this is really handy. Even driving in town, you can use this technology. You have to set it about a little over 25 miles an hour and then it uh, will take over that uh, braking uh, from there. So when you start looking at when this technology comes into cars that we can begin to uh, a Ford, uh, Subaru was really sort of the first low-end car to implement something called EyeSight. Uh, and if you look at most new Subarus today, you'll look at behind the rearview mirror and you'll see two cameras. And this is a stereoscopic vision system, a uh, computer vision system that looks ahead. And what it does is it draws boxes around uh, pedestrians and bicycles and cars. Uh, and pedestrians become vertical boxes uh, uh, and uh, cars become squares. And essentially the computer just is measuring the size of those boxes and many of them at the same time. And when those boxes grow, that means you're getting close to a car or a pedestrian. And once you reach a certain threshold, it will either warn the driver to, hey, there's something out there, or more likely it's gonna put on the brakes very urgently. Uh, so this technology, again, now Subaru is making this standard in almost all of their vehicles. Uh, uh, Volvo has something called City Safety uh, that came out about six years ago, and they have actually three different cameras that look at different distances. And then they have a little radar system in the bumper of the car and the grill that looks ahead. And you can see those bicyclists, it's also drawing boxes around um, what we call targets, which is sometimes not very popular to talk about pedestrians as targets. Uh, but this system is actually required by the Swedish government now on all cars because pedestrian uh, strikes are pretty common in Europe uh, and the Swedish government wants to eliminate those. So they required this technology on all new cars several years ago uh, sold in Sweden. So when you walk down the streets of Gothenburg or Stockholm, you will see these little cameras almost in every uh, car out there because they rotate their cars pretty quickly uh, in their overall uh, fleet out there. So now we, you, you may have seen a technology called blind spot detection, which is really super handy when you're on the highway and a car is passing you, that blind spot you've learned about since you were in driver's ed probably. Uh, this system uses cameras and sometimes even a radar system that's built into the rear bumper uh, of the car. They, they operate very differently. So there are many different sensors on the next generation of production cars. So these are not really uh, unusual and rare, but they're also in really inexpensive cars. So if you take a look at the Chevy Cruze, the Toyota Corolla, the Honda Civic, for $21,000 you get uh, uh, a system that will break in an emergency for you, it will keep you in your lane, and these are in these entry-level cars. So this is, I think, one of the most exciting things uh, out there because the car of today is really bristling with technologies that you never even see. All these cameras, on uh, radar systems. So adaptive cruise control is looking the furthest down the road uh, from a medium uh, 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 distance. You're looking at pedestrian detection, collision avoidance, 
and those kinds of things, and then even backing. Uh, so uh, not to pick on one particular uh, car maker, Subaru has something automatic uh, backing braking. So you can't even back into a post anymore on purpose. It will put on the brakes and not let you uh, do that. Again, this is on a fairly pedestrian car. It's not on a $100,000 car. It's on a $25,000, $27,000 car. So this is really this bubble of protection is here today. And I think those of us who study car crashes uh, every day are really excited about these technologies that are coming out. And, and over the next 20 years, all cars will have that. It takes about 20 years to be able to cycle through uh, the entire US fleet before we can say that we have really significant, over 95% of the fleet in the US will have that. So for instance, analog brake systems, which came out in around 1996, about 95% of US cars on the road today have analog brake systems. So it takes about 20 years. So when you start to see these technologies like this today, it's going to be uh, 20 years from now before we see most cars uh, having this stuff uh, on board. So the other element that's really critical and then that the state of Iowa is investing uh, heavily in is something called high definition maps. So on your cell phone or on the navigation system in your car, the resolution that you have, which is really phenomenal, is still plus or minus about three feet. So you can know within six feet where you are uh, anywhere in the world with your GPS system. But that's not very good for a car that has to be able to drive down the road. So uh, the Iowa DOT is investing in high definition maps, which get that instead of like plus or minus six feet, get that down to plus or minus three inches. So that we can drive pretty reliably uh, on the road. Because the next generation of cars, it's all about redundancy in our sensors so that we can be really assured that we have all the information so the car can make sure that the traffic light is really green. Uh, and uh, so we need multiple signals to make sure that we can corroborate the state of that traffic light because there are some critical issues in driving that are really important. So high definition maps, we have some 1,300 miles of roads in the Iowa City, Cedar Rapids, North Liberty, Coralville area, highways, freeways, uh, metropolitan areas that are being mapped as we speak uh, that we'll be able to get this kind of resolution uh, to be able to really understand where the car is relative to what it sees uh, around it, similar to what I just showed here. So you add this plus really accurate position information that's going to be important. So heavy trucks uh, is yet another sort of technology uh, that we're seeing. And there's a, something called platooning. Uh, and this is where we sort of put together short uh, truck trains that are drafting uh, to save fuel. And what we do, it's really the, the better way to talk about it is really sort of open freeway driving with connected braking systems. And so what these, car, these trucks do is that each one of these trucks has a driver. The front truck here is controlling the brakes from the ones of the trucks that are following behind. So if something happens ahead of this guy here, these trucks will brake immediately. And those of you that are familiar with these big brake systems of trucks, they're air brakes. When you press a truck brake when you're out driving down the freeway, it takes a long time for that big, heavy machine to start to break. These systems are much different. They break immediately because those, those brakes are already pre-charged uh, and ready for action uh, as they're driving down the highway. If we look even further down the road uh, in truck uh, and freeway uh, operations, uh, we see something that may be very similar to what happens in the maritime industry, and that is where we will have essentially uh, freeway pilots or freeway uh, automation. And then locally, you might have essentially a, uh, what's known in, in, in the maritime as a, a harbor pilot. So one thing that's really tough about over-the-road trucking is that you're not home very often. You might be on the road for three weeks, sometimes four weeks at a time. Imagine uh, a person who just drives a truck around Iowa City. They take them from Interstate uh, 80 and then uh, uh, bring them in to sort of that last mile, do that docking 
uh, out there so that you can sleep in your own bed every night has really phenomenal implications for the family uh, in this particular profession. Now, whenever we uh, have a story that comes out about a lot of this technology, we invariably get a call from the Teamsters or a labor union saying, you're just out to take away our jobs. Uh, so we have really good data about that because we're all about data as university researchers. Uh, the American Trucking Association, which is one of the big trade groups uh, uh, around tr uh, trucking, has done some uh, really interesting analyses looking at uh, how big of a labor shortage there are in over-the-road uh, trucks. And a couple of years ago, they published a, a, a pretty major uh, report about uh, the shortage in driving. And in fact, one of our local uh, CEO, CEOs, Dave Rush, said that uh, I've been in the business for 34 years. I've never seen the driver situation like this today. Typically, if we have freight, we can expand, but we can't grow now because we don't have enough drivers. A similar uh, 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 CEO in uh, Oklahoma uh, talks about they're essentially turning down freight delivery because they can't find enough drivers out there. So the key findings are report that in 2014, the trucking industry was short 38,000 jobs. Uh, by the end of 2015, it was 48,000. Uh, and as estimated by 2024, which is really not that far away in the next seven, eight years, 175,000 jobs short. So some of this technology, we can't say that we're going to have robots driving down the, the freeway uh, in the next 25 years. I, I seriously doubt that will ever happen, uh, at least in my lifetime. Well, maybe in my lifetime, but under very controlled situations. But in terms of a regular kind of automated route, it's going to be a while. But a lot of these incremental technologies uh, are out there as well. So much is sort of uh, at stake in this, and safety is really a critical one. And last fall, uh, one of the automated vehicle companies called Auto uh, did a very public demonstration of a driverless truck uh, where this guy is actually sitting in the sleeper berth. At one point, he was doing yoga uh, while he was driving down the freeway uh, just outside of Denver. Uh, what, what the public doesn't know about a lot of these sort of public demonstrations is that they're highly scripted. Uh, this truck was delivering 30,000 cans of Budweiser uh, with the driver sitting in the back. But all these cars that are out here, this is actually really early in the morning at sunrise. They have police escorts. These are all kind of people in different cars uh, driving around, highly scripted. But the, the uh, media impact was enormous uh, for this. So I just uh, Google uh, auto plus Budweiser and you'll get some really interesting uh, videos from this demonstration. So it tends to be some overhype that you see out there. There's really a big difference between what is occurring in reality uh, versus what the marketing machines of Uber and Google and Auto and a number of other companies are doing. They're doing real work on the road in driverless work, but it's the implementation side. The policy issues are really lagging behind the technology. We can do lots of demonstrations of these systems, but the everyday applications uh, are much more difficult. So safety is really critical. And what we see is uh, about a little over a year ago, year and a half ago now, uh, Tesla had its first fatal crash uh, and that one fatal crash sent shockwaves through the entire industry. And one of the big challenges is that uh, even though we have a significant public health crisis in terms of the uh, uh, car crashes in the U.S., last year we killed 40,000 people on roads in the U.S. alone. 404 died in Iowa, a 27% increase in fatalities in Iowa alone in one year. So 40,000 people, think about that, uh, dying in the US in a car crash. So we assign hundreds of millions, billions of dollars into diseases that kill far fewer people, but yet we uh, nickel and dime people a couple every weekend in Iowa, uh, certainly uh, almost every hour uh, in the US. And we've all been touched somehow by somebody who's been injured or even uh, killed uh, in a car crash. We're pretty forgiving when one of our friends or our relatives gets into a crash. 
uh, sometimes are called accidents. Uh, for those of you who know me, I'm sort of the big campaigner of eradicating that word out of the English language because crashes and injuries have causes. So it's important for the public to know what all those causes are so that we can prevent them uh, in the future. And so when a robot, an automated car crashes, we don't have the same kind of empathy uh, and sympathy that we do for a human driver that gets into a crash. So this is gonna be a huge challenge. So even when Google drives around in, in their very much supervised automated cars, because they're on the road literally 24 hours a day and in traffic, they get hit from behind, just like we get hit from behind. We're in collisions are really the most common crash type in the US. And so it makes really big news. Even though they have zero at fault, it still makes national headlines. If you just type the word Google car crash, you'll get thousands of articles about a car that just stops at a stoplight and they get rear-ended and all of a sudden that's big news, even though there are literally on any, any given day in the US, thousands, tens of thousands of the same kind of crashes out there. So the point is that we don't have much tolerance for crashes that occur by an automated system. And this is gonna be really one of the bigger challenges as we move forward. So the word driverless, They're, all these words are uh, the nuanced terms, driverless, automated, autonomous, uh, are really important to pay attention to because driverless uh, suggests that you don't have any driver, there's no, there's no steering wheel, there's no brake pedal. It's like getting into an elevator. So if you think about what it was like to ride in an elevator 60 years ago, 70 years ago, there were not people that would even conceive of getting into an elevator that didn't have an operator. Uh, 40 years ago, we didn't even conceive about getting into a train at an airport and going from terminal to terminal. So we have to think about the transition from different modes in transportation from where there's always been an operator a driver to no driver. So we're starting to see some of that occur in the driverless uh, world, but the reality is that they are slow and very slow. Uh, the Google car, this little pod here, which has now already been retired, it's obsolete, it's being donated to museums and everywhere, was never designed to go more than 25 miles an hour. It uh, couldn't survive a crash faster than that and protect its occupants faster. We have uh, in operation some completely driverless uh, narrow gauge buses that are being used in some parts of Europe and France and Greece, uh, Germany, UK. Uh, one of these is actually operating outside of Washington DC, but they go really slow. They go like five miles an hour, seven miles an hour. Uh, and they're really conservative. They stop uh, whenever there's any kind of trajectory of a pedestrian walking anywhere near them, they just kind of stop and wait, try to figure things out. So they can be really frustrating to ride because you can literally walk to where you're going faster than this thing goes. So the key headline here for true driverless is they go really slow. So when you see an article in the paper or something on the television, uh, remember that there's lots of constraints. When Uber says they're operating in driverless cars in Pittsburgh, they don't usually tell you that there's two safety drivers on board and they're instructed not to try to talk to their passengers. Uh, so there's lots of constraints uh, out there. So the short term reality uh, out there, uh, we have been designated uh, as one of 10 uh, proving grounds in the US to allow uh, some of these semi-automated uh, vehicles uh, to run uh, on, the, on, the, on the highways around here, Interstate 380 and around. There were 64 applications that the US Department of Transportation uh, received around the country. They picked 10 and we were really super excited to be one of those 10 places. Our partners, key partners with the Iowa City Area Development Group are really important because the federal government is very interested in the economic development aspects of uh, these vehicles and how they can help bring industry uh, uh, around because one of the things that's really different about this next generation of industry is historically we had the big three car companies, Chrysler, uh, Ford, General Motors. And now of course we add uh, Asian uh, 
car companies, European car companies to the mix. You might have 20 different car companies worldwide. But the next generation of cars is being developed by thousands of really small companies that have eight people, 10 people, and as integrating a lot of these technologies where they're specialists in special computer vision uh, for cars, software specialties, all of these people are working independently and are not necessarily working for the really big car company. So that integration becomes a really big deal for this next generation of cars. We have some really great uh, new testing opportunities here. Many have read that we're gonna have these new fabulous interchanges that are being built, enormously expensive, but it's an opportunity to build in new infrastructure that we can tap into as researchers and understand how these technologies uh, are going to work out there. We're also bringing lots of people from around the world to Iowa. Iowa City is known for its literature, uh, uh, its medicine, lots of different uh, areas. We, we brought a, a group from Sweden here uh, recently to meet with then Governor Branstad and then Kim Reynolds, and this is uh, Paul Trombino, the former Iowa DOT director to talk about Sweden's experience in implementing some of the uh, semi-automated testing on their roads. And we were one of the first to bring the Swedish government here to, to learn about how they did that with the public. And I'll share with you a short video that Sweden is now uh, essentially preparing its, uh, uh, the Swedes for the very long-term plan in in how automation is going to affect the biggest cities uh, in Sweden. So the Swedish collab collaboration, we have a formal partnership with Volvo, the Swedish government, uh, and SAFER, which is a research institute at Chalmers University, is kind of the MIT of uh, uh, Sweden. And uh, so we uh, get to work with them. I've had students go and work uh, for Volvo in Sweden. We bring their faculty here uh, to collaborate. So it's a really fun, uh, collaboration. They're doing some really terrific work uh, and are really leading the world in terms of the policy issues that are so important about how uh, uh, local, uh, regional, and federal government resources look at uh, automation. So one of the projects that's really cool in the city of Gothenburg, which is the second largest city in Sweden, is where Volvo is built, where they do their engineering and design. Uh, and manufacturing. In fact, what's interesting about Gothenburg is most of the Midwest Scandinavians came through the port of Gothenburg. So we're known in Iowa and in uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin has a huge number of Scandinavians, Norwegians, uh, Swedes, Danes, uh, uh, and they all came through the port of Gothenburg. Uh, so I'm going to show you a project called Drive Me, which is a uh, uh, one, the first automated highway uh, in the world where they have given away 100 Volvo XC90s, and we have a similar vehicle. It doesn't have the same exact instrumentation, but we were one of the first to get one of these vehicles a year and a half ago, a full year before it even became uh, available uh, on the roads here. Now, what's unique about this is that this technology, which is super cool, only works on that road. So as soon as you exit that road, the car is in a regular driving mode. And that's why the nuance of these terms is really important to the, I think, to the public, is that what they're calling self-driving is only good on that ring road 19 miles around uh, the city. But once you're on that road, it's super cool. But once you exit, it becomes a regular uh, car again. So the Swedes are really uh, far ahead of, of everybody uh, else out there. So the other project that I'm going to talk about, it's another quick three-minute video, is something called Drive Sweden. And this is the first, this is how the government is communicating with Swedes to say, we have a long-term vision, we have a 50-year vision of what transportation is going to be like in our urban areas, primarily Stockholm and Gothenburg, uh, because we don't have any more space for cars. Uh, so what are we going to do? And so driverless cars, true driverless cars operating just in the city center core uh, are one uh, option. But this is really an interesting sort of perspective to get the public uh, sort of prepared for how to think about urban sprawl, uh, which doesn't really exist there because European cities are really constrained by their history. 
Uh, so there's really no, no way to build out to strip malls and out into uh, suburban areas because they have very strict uh, urban planning uh, laws and rules. So one of the cars that's parked outside that I want to sort of wrap up here so we can go take a look, those of you who haven't got a chance to look at it, is one of our uh, vehicles that's in the, uh, as part of our research fleet of a number of vehicles that we have uh, in our fleet. And this is really uh, the most advanced production vehicle that has uh, driver's assistance systems that will allow you to drive on the highway for some short, very extended times for a couple of minutes, perhaps. Uh, uh, but this is really uh, a very interesting integrated car that we're uh, studying here, and it's very unique. It has a huge screen in it. Uh, uh, it parks by itself, both in perpendicular spots and parallel spots. Uh, it's really kind of the best of the best at doing lots of different functions. So we'll talk about that uh, uh, a little bit uh, later outside. So one thing about all these different technologies, so I mentioned analog brake systems, uh, you know, those have been around for 20 years now. Uh, people still are having trouble, you know, holding down that brake, feeling what that buzzing, that vibration is uh, out there. Uh, we, with our colleagues at the National Safety Council, uh, created a national education campaign around some 40 different technologies that are just blossoming really quickly uh, in cars. So if you go to mycardoeswhat.org, uh, uh, you can see all of these technologies. We even have a guy and his dog, Rick and Scout, explaining these technologies uh, really plainly. Uh, we just had our 6.4 billionth media impression. This is the largest public education campaign ever with safety technology. So we're super excited to uh, have been part of leading that uh, national campaign uh, out there. So mycardoeswhat.org, uh, go visit that uh, out there. So what's really fun about uh, being here at the University of Iowa and in Iowa in general, you all, uh, if you've lived here for any amount of time, uh, sort of know what Iowa NICE is about. And we have, I, I think, is a tremendous economic development uh, culture here because we work a lot with the Iowa DOT economic development authorities, and we can just call them up. We work with them very closely. Uh, many state DOTs uh, don't have the relationships with their research universities to be able to integrate uh, not only policy issues, but uh, working on the road uh, and so forth. So the kind of cooperation that we have with the cities, the city of Iowa City, Coralville, North Liberty, Cedar Rapids, is really phenomenal. It's, it's really unlike any other place. California uh, is a huge state. They have a lot of uh, trouble uh, integrating all of those resources because there are many different political uh, constituencies uh, there. It's much easier uh, to do that here in Iowa. So with that, thank you very much. Uh, happy to take some questions before we head outside. And we're going to use this microphone to get everybody uh, on the recording. So. Thank you for the nice presentation. Okay, so how about for um, environmental impact and energy efficiency? What is the projection? Does the driverless cars contribute to that or are there other solutions for transportation that might be more energy efficient? Yeah, so the great uh, news with regard to more highly automated vehicles in the future, they're uh, largely electric. The Tesla is a pure electric car. Um, when you take a look at truck platooning, we can say between 7 and 12 percent fuel when you start to team up uh, with those uh, trucks, uh, when they usually get two or three trucks uh, in a row. Uh, most of the time, they're coupled, but when they come into uh, an urban area like Des Moines or even Iowa City, they all separate. So during that time, they're not taking advantage of that uh, fuel efficiency, but most over-the-road trucks are not operating in urban areas for long periods of time. So that fuel economy savings is big. And if you talk to CRST, Heartland, fuel is one of their largest expenses outside of labor. Uh, so electrics uh, and then the kinds of savings that we're seeing uh, with 
uh, platooning trucks. Yes? What about other alternatives besides electric? Are the, I've heard about hydrogen-powered cars. Is that kind of like on the wane? Or maybe even um, are there other advancements in battery capacity that will allow them to travel farther between chargers? Yeah, so electrics are really taking over. So hydrogen cells were, were you know, 20 years ago, that was kind of the direction because we couldn't get the battery weight issue under control and the length of, of time. So the Tesla outside will drive about 230 miles on a charge. Uh, the Chevy Bolt, which is a much less expensive vehicle, will drive around 200 miles. Tesla has a Model 3 that starts at about $35,000, which will also go about 200 miles on a charge. And this battery technology is just getting better and better. And the length of time it takes to charge one of those big batteries gets shorter and shorter. So from a zero charge, this car outside, if you go to the hy on, on uh, in Corville, it takes about an hour to fully charge a car that's going to go 230 miles uh, on that charge. This car, we have about 1,900 miles on it. And uh, last Friday, we calculated how much uh, cost in electricity it cost. For 1,900 miles, we spent $45. So think about what your car, what you would have spent on fuel. Today's gas is pretty cheap, all things considered. But when gas is four or five bucks a gallon or nine bucks a gallon like it is in Europe, uh, that becomes a pretty substantial cost. Um, I noticed, OK, you talked about autonomous cars. Is the idea of a remote-driven car something that got leapfrogged, or is that yeah, so if you take a look at the, the, those narrow gauge buses that I talked about uh, earlier, uh, those actually are similar to uh, the remotely piloted vehicles that the military uses. They may have one operator that's looking at several of those buses. So let's say that bus comes across something in the road and there's no way to drive around it. So these kinds of fully self-driving cars obey the traffic laws perfectly, and they won't ever deviate them. So if you have a double yellow line, like is right outside the window here, it will never cross that line no matter what. Whereas we would say, OK, there's, there's a, somebody's sweater fell off their bicycle, and it's in the road. And so this, that, that same bus won't drive around that sweater or whatever that object is in the road. It will just sit there and really not know what to do. So this is where the people remotely can look around and see what that is and sort of make the decision to drive around that uh, system. The reason I asked you this is that I, I bought a car about five years ago, and I asked the salesman, you know, are all the linkages still there? Like, if I turn the steering wheel and they actually mechanically connected, and he said, no, it's all computerized. You've got haptic feedback on your steering wheel, haptic feedback on your brake and your accelerator. You don't actually interact with the engine directly, which means you're already remotely driving it. You're just sitting in it when you do it. So if you wanted to create cars for people to drive elderly people to the supermarket, you could basically take that technology and just put it through a system maybe where it's going over cell lines or something. Is that something that? Yeah, I mean, it's to drive individually a car is still uh, remotely is still hard to do, especially in regular traffic. And so there are very limited conditions where you might be able to do that at slow speeds. Uh, what you're talking about sort of those pure digital uh, connections between steering and braking. Every car has something a little differently. There are a few cars that have a completely digital uh, uh, interface, so there is no mechanics. There are still most cars have mechanical interfaces. Braking. Uh, uh, accelerator, those become uh, a little bit more uh, digital. Uh, steering is still in, in regular cars, uh, uh, not a completely digital experience. So remotely uh, operating is really more in the long-term future is where a person might sit and manage several uh, vehicles. And then when something goes wrong, they can zoom into that one and make decisions that the computer can't. The developers of driverless cars would probably love to have a situation where their cars aren't interacting with cars ever being driven by people. And so um, I assume that having to create a separate set of streets and highways 
um, as soon as cost prohibitive. Um, yeah, that's impossible. Right, right. But was that being looked at? Was that initially was was that being um, part of the equation when they were developing this? No. In fact, the really beauty of these technologies is that there is really no infrastructure other than good paint and traffic signals that can talk to you and, and these new high definition maps. So uh, these sensors are looking around the world all the time and it doesn't matter whether it's an automated vehicle or a manually driven vehicle, it's very careful and is very acutely aware of threats. Uh, so it's constantly thinking that somebody's out to hit me. And that's why these vehicles are really conservative. Like the Volvo, if you drive it on the highway, it's looking at the car ahead of you that's exiting, and we can see that there are blinkers on, and it's already leaving the road. But the Volvo is watching that car and slowing down Interstate 80 till like 45 miles an hour, till that car's way out of the way. The car behind you is really mad at you because you're going 45, and you can't figure out why you're only going that fast. The Tesla is much better in that scenario where it accelerates back up to speed. But the main thing is that they're looking around the environment. And, and what I was saying earlier about the inexpensive technologies like the Honda Civic and the Toyota Corolla and the Chevy Cruze and all these entry-level cars, that technology, automatic emergency braking systems, those are the technologies that are interacting today to prevent uh, those kinds of crashes. So it's really sort of incremental uh, automation. I'm just thinking about the regulatory environment for these vehicles where you have so many different uh, uh, manufacturers and systems and all of that. Uh, what does it look, and then repair of vehicles. I know <laughs> I hit a bumper with like those sensors in it and the repair goes from 500 to like 1,000. But, um, but the regular, like how we have trouble now keeping those catalytic converters going and everything like that. <laughs> How about the regulatory environment to keep these vehicles uh, safe and when we all own one? Yeah, so I think there's two things. There's reliability of these systems I think you're getting at, which just like the computer, your phone, uh, your, your laptop, uh, everything is sort of an appliance today. You know, some of you probably owned racks to drive your car up to to change your own oil at some point in your life. That doesn't happen in the next generation of drivers. They're much more impatient. And uh, so cars are really going to be and are becoming quickly an appliance that, uh, you know, if you look at leasing today versus buying, it just becomes a monthly payment in your life. And then you just turn it in when it breaks and you get a new one. So uh, we're going to be sharing cars more in the future, in the long-range future, like Uber. Uh, those of you are, have, have used that uh, ride-sharing services. So we may not even own a car in the future, that we may just uh, accept even a couple hundred bucks a month where we don't have to pay for insurance or parking uh, maintenance. It's, a, it's a, just a cost that we, we uh, uh, put up with. In terms of the regulatory environment, it's a really interesting question, and, and regulation changes depending on what presidential administration and culture you might have, right? Uh, so the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, which is part of the U.S. Department of Transportation, is in charge of safety regulation for the federal, U.S. federal government. Uh, they put together a set of guidelines which are fairly loose uh, in the Obama administration. What we're seeing in the Trump administration is essentially a wiping of that, uh, which I think concerns me personally because uh, the, the public will not be that forgiving once we start having some crashes. So we need to be very careful on this very front end of the next generation of, of, of this technology so that we don't get the public alarmed and think that these systems are very dangerous. We had a question up here in the front. Okay, we'll do one more and then we get across the thing the car. Okay. You may have answered this, but our car has the lane departure alert. The warning. It, the it, warning and, yep. and the wheel kind of tightens up. As yep. you, is there something, what is it reading? What, what is, it, is it something in the paint? Yep, it's reading the lane lines in the road. Is it's there something see, in the paint? Nope, it's just a camera in the front of your car. I'll come over and show you. <laughs> but yeah, the, most of these cars are all just, they use computer vision. So it's a, a computer that has a, a, a camera that's looking at the lane lines and it just, 
uh, makes a road for you. And as soon as you drift over a certain point, it's going to alert you or even slightly put you back in the lane again. And this is an exciting technology because in the US, the most fatal kind of car crash is what's called a single vehicle roadway departure. And that most people die in the US. They drift off the road a little bit. They drop a wheel on that kind of rough edge. They overcorrect, lose control, go into the ditch, hit a culvert, a tree. That's how you die in the US, is in a car by yourself. You don't hit another car. We certainly have vehicle to vehicle crashes. But how you die in a car crash in the US, in North America, is on a country road. Because you're going faster, they're less forgiving. The highway, the freeway, Interstate 80, is actually a really safe place to drive because it's really wide. And generally, there's not a lot of traffic. So when you go out of the lane, you got lots of room to come back in again and, uh, and so forth. So, but yeah, it's a camera. You go look in the front of your car, you'll see a little trapezoid shaped thing uh, in there. And that's just looking at the paint stripe ahead. Well, why don't we go outside? Well, thank you so much, Dan. This was wonderful. And if, if you haven't had a chance to go out and see his car, go out and take a look and He'll let you sit in. He won't let you drive it in. We're not auctioning it off. <laughs> but you can go sit in it.